Greetings everyone, I'm Adam Harriton. Something that I often do out here in the woods is ask questions. And one question that I like to ask is some variation of why do things look the way that they do? When we take a look at an ecosystem like this forest, and we think about all the different forces that can significantly alter and have historically altered the looks and functions of this forest, we might think of things like fire and wind and humans. But we probably don't immediately think of pigeons. And why would we? Any effect of pigeons on the landscape seems rather mild in comparison to something like a wildfire or a logging operation. But what if I told you that the way this forest looks today might have something to do with a particular pigeon species that went extinct in 1914? Would you believe me? Well, as it turns out, Eastern North American forests have been shaped in profound ways by one of the most iconic birds to have ever graced the North American continent, the passenger pigeon. And the legacy and ripple effects set into motion by the passenger pigeon can still be observed in forested ecosystems today. The passenger pigeon was a nomadic species that at one time was the most abundant bird in North America, with a total population estimated at three to five billion individuals in the early and middle 1800s. Flocks of passenger pigeons were so massive that observers would often remark how dark and loud the skies would be for days, while hundreds of millions of passenger pigeons blocked the sun and migrated to their spring breeding grounds. The famous ornithologist John James Audubon recalled that the air was literally filled with pigeons. The light of noonday was obscured as by an eclipse. The dung fell in spots not unlike melting flakes of snow. Passenger pigeons amazed and mystified observers in ways that few other natural phenomena did at the time. But all of this soon came to an abrupt end. Passenger pigeon numbers dropped precipitously towards the end of the 19th century, and in 1914, the species was declared extinct. How did this happen? How is it even possible for a species numbering in the billions to be reduced to zero individuals in the span of a few short decades? While multiple factors contributed to the extinction of the passenger pigeon, with the most consequential being the commercial harvesting of pigeons for food, feathers, and sport. Now, indigenous people on the North American continent historically hunted passenger pigeons, and multiple accounts of these practices exist, but it wasn't until European Americans took to the fields, farms, and woods with their nets and their clubs and bows and guns that passenger pigeon populations experienced the most drastic declines. Habitat loss, and the spread of two major technological advancements, the railroad and the telegraph, also contributed to the demise of passenger pigeons. Now, unregulated killing and commercial harvesting only intensified during the second half of the 19th century. And while wild passenger pigeons still existed in 1890, they did so in pitifully low quantities. These low numbers became even lower until the last wild passenger pigeon was killed in 1902. A few captive flocks were kept alive, but numbers within these flocks quickly dwindled until all that was left was a single captive female who died on September 1st, 1914 at the Cincinnati Zoo. Clearly the passenger pigeon was no ordinary species. Numbering in the billions, the passenger pigeon in its heyday was a keystone species, an ecosystem engineer that profoundly affected the North American landscape in many ways. These birds were dietary generalists, and they ate a variety of foods, including insects, soft fruits like elderberries and service berries, seeds like maple seeds and pine seeds, and hard mast, including beech nuts, acorns, and chestnuts. And the reliance of passenger pigeons on hard mast may have contributed to an important ecological phenomenon in the Holocene. Ecologists have long wondered how certain trees with heavy seeds, notably beeches and oaks, expanded their range northward in North America following the last glaciation 10 to 15,000 years ago, as rapidly as trees with light wind dispersed seeds did. Ecologist Sarah Webb offered her thoughts and suggested that passenger pigeons could have provided some assistance, not through fecal dispersal of seeds, but through regurgitation of seeds 
and through the release of undigested seeds at the time of death. According to Sarah Webb, in light of passenger pigeon abundance, capacity for delayed digestion, and nomadic habits, it would be surprising if this bird did not disperse seeds of its food plants at least occasionally. Passenger pigeons may have influenced the tree composition of North American forests in another way. Hard mast was consumed by passenger pigeons, particularly during the spring nesting season. The largest nesting sites were reported to be in the northern part of the species range, generally in the Great Lakes states and provinces. Ecologists have suggested that passenger pigeons nested in northern forests to take advantage of mast crops that were produced in the autumn, but covered with snow throughout the winter months. According to this hypothesis, snow-covered seeds and nuts would be largely unavailable throughout the winter season to other mast-consuming animals, but would eventually be made available during the late winter early spring snow melt, coinciding with the arrival of passenger pigeons. Now, not all mast would be available as food in the spring. Think about acorns, for example. Acorns from members of the white oak group germinate in the fall. Acorns from members of the red oak group overwinter and germinate in the spring. According to some ecologists, passenger pigeons arriving in northern forests in the spring would have better access to overwintering red oak acorns because the food value of white oak acorns would be minimal in the spring. With better access to red oak acorns, passenger pigeons could inhibit the reproductive success of red oaks. This idea has led some ecologists to speculate that the feeding and nesting habits of passenger pigeons contributed to the dominance of white oaks over red oaks in pre-settlement forests. Further supporting this claim is the fact that after passenger pigeons became extinct in 1914, northern red oak, Quercus rubra, increased in abundance in many eastern forests, while white oak, Quercus alba, decreased. Now, some ecologists have attributed the relatively recent decrease in white oak abundance to something else, a reduction in low intensity disturbances, including understory fire. But some of these same ecologists have also admitted that fire alone might not fully explain the shifts in oak composition, and that a truly compelling explanation of how Quercus rubra, northern red oak, increased so dramatically in various regions where it seemingly was a minor component of the pre-settlement forest has still not been formulated. Still, other ecologists have proposed that the elimination of passenger pigeons as a spring predator on acorns of the red oak group may have been an additional factor in favor of a shift in oak species composition. Now, it's worth pointing out that some ecologists question a few of the preceding ideas, but most ecologists do agree almost unanimously on something else. They agree that passenger pigeons strongly influenced forests by acting as agents of large-scale understory and canopy disturbances, specifically through their roosting and nesting habits. Passenger pigeons roosted and nested communally in forests and shrublands. These roosting and nesting colonies were huge. They often contained tens of millions of birds spread out over dozens of miles, and it wasn't uncommon for a single tree to contain between 50 to 100 nests per tree. The largest nesting colony recorded in history was observed in 1871 in Wisconsin, and it was reported to cover 850 square miles and contain 135 million adult passenger pigeons. Historic accounts frequently describe what effects these roosting and nesting pigeons had on the landscape. One man wrote that, where the pigeons roost, the limbs of the trees are broken off in all directions by their numbers. Davy Crockett, the famous American frontiersman, wrote that the timber, even though it be of the largest growth, is so split and broken by the immense numbers which roost upon it as to be rendered entirely useless. He went on to say that a pigeon roost resembles very much a section of country over which has passed a violent hurricane. By all accounts, passenger pigeons were quite destructive. The sheer weight of countless pigeons communally roosting and nesting bent trees to the ground, broke branches, and toppled entire trees. Now, an obvious effect of limbs breaking and trees toppling over for any reason in a forest is an increase in light at the forest floor caused by gaps in the canopy. In present-day forests, 
these kinds of disturbances at low intensities are often the result of ice storms or moderate wind storms. When these disturbances occur at greater intensities, they're often the result of strong wind storms that level huge swaths of forest. And it's not uncommon to read reports from the 1700s and 1800s comparing the effects of roosting passenger pigeons to tornadoes sweeping through the forest. These kinds of effects create early successional habitats dominated by light demanding pioneer species and moderately shade intolerant disturbance dependent species. The larger forces of disturbance caused by roosting and nesting passenger pigeons likely benefited certain trees, including oaks and eastern white pine. In addition to breaking trees, passenger pigeons excreted a lot of droppings. A surveyor at the time wrote that it is no strange thing to find the ground covered three inches thick with their dung. Another surveyor wrote that their dung commonly lies half a foot thick and kills everything that grows where it falls. Historic accounts frequently describe the understories of passenger pigeon roosts and nests as being blanketed with droppings and containing no living vegetation on the forest floor, sometimes for thousands of acres. Interestingly, these same roosting and nesting grounds were later reported to be among the most fertile lands for farming. These forces of disturbance, the breaking of trees and the creation of coarse woody debris, the killing of vegetation by droppings and the altering of soil chemistry by droppings combined together may have exacerbated another force of disturbance, wildfire. This in turn may have influenced the kinds of trees likely to grow in such areas. Ecologists have made it clear that oaks dominated many pre-settlement forests and savannas in eastern North America. A good explanation as to why oaks dominated these ecosystems is that frequent wildfires burned the landscape and benefited fire tolerant trees, including bur oak, black oak, and white oak. According to some ecologists, passenger pigeons, through their disturbance regimes of roosting and nesting and breaking limbs and increasing the amount of combustible fuel on the landscape and killing understory vegetation, may have exacerbated the effects of wildfire and contributed to the dominance of oaks on the landscape up until the end of the 19th century. It's difficult to overstate just how influential the passenger pigeon was on the North American landscape. And while several details regarding the life, biology and ecology of the passenger pigeon remain obscure and may never be known, two things are clear. Number one, the passenger pigeon profoundly altered eastern North American forests by causing major understory and canopy disturbances. And number two, the passenger pigeon is extinct. Some people are working to bring the species back from extinction, but as it currently stands, there are no passenger pigeons alive today. The last living member of the species was a female named Martha. Martha died on September 1st, 1914, allegedly at the age of 29, in captivity at the Cincinnati Zoo. The American folk songwriter John Harold wasn't there to witness the historic event, but he did imagine in a song what the experience might have been like when he wrote, surrounded there by some of whom wept around her, in a corner of the cage they found her. She went as soft as she came, so shy till the last song. Oh, the passenger pigeon was gone. When we look at forested ecosystems in North America today, we obviously don't see Martha. We don't see roosting and nesting colonies of her species in any beech or oak forest, nor do we see massive flocks of her species eclipsing the sun and darkening the skies. But if we look closely enough, and if we study the ecology of North American landscapes, we do see something worthy of our attention we see rippling effects of forces that were first set into motion many years ago by Martha's ancestors, who for centuries and for millennia roosted, nested, lived in communal groups, and changed the ways in which North American forests would function and continue to evolve. When we walk through a wooded landscape in Eastern North America today, and we ask ourselves, why do things look the way that they do? Perhaps no answer can fully satisfy that question unless it involves some link, however distant, however long forgotten, to the iconic passenger pigeon, a keystone species that engineered North America's forests.